Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Gifford through LinkedIn, <laughs> which was, is a great way for us to, to connect. And uh, um, his subject is something that we're all very close to. Um, I'm just delighted to have you. He is a, um, I'm going to have you give your titles because I know you teach at George Mason and your program um, a director at the Smithsonian in Washington, but I don't have all the particulars. Please, Dan Gifford. Thank you so much. Well, the, actually, the conversation about um, the connections between ephemera and academia were very interesting to me because my whole doctorate was based on holiday postcards. Um, and so the idea of using these uh, artifacts as, as the source for cultural material for the, the beginning of a, a series of questions that can be answered um, is very near and dear to my heart. So um, yes, I, I, I teach part-time at George Mason University. I uh, focus on courses that deal with popular culture, material culture, visual culture. Um, I encourage my students to use ephemera in their papers and um, to uh, take it seriously as a, a, an academic source. So I am out there in the trenches <laughs> for you. Uh, professionally, I work in the administration side, what we call the castle um, side of the Smithsonian. Um, and I'm very pleased to be here. Um, this is a flash presentation, so this is just a teeny tiny little snippet of, of this. Uh, but uh, I wanted to, to sort of play off the, the theme of the conference of, of uh, food and food history. Um, and talk about Im images that come out of Thanksgiving. Um, and as anyone that you know, has dealt with a lot of holiday postcards knows, there's a ton of Thanksgiving postcards. Um, and a lot of those postcards uh, juxtapose tr sort of traditional Thanksgiving imagery with patriotic imagery. All the bells and whistles of stars and stripes, red, white, and blue, bald eagles, Uncle Sam's, et cetera, et cetera. And want to sort of get at the question of why, why is that? What, what is, what are those artifacts trying to tell us? What, what stories do they tell? Um, so to boil down two years of research into my first minute of my 15 minutes, um, one of the big questions that I had going into this project was the question of audience. And, and one of the things I loved about this conference and one of the themes we heard over and over again on, um, gosh, what day was that, Friday? Friday, um, it all blurs together. One of the things I, I really loved that people said over and over again is how ephemera tells stories, tells personal stories. And so one of the things I wanted to do was take that sort of personal level and sort of elevate it to the next level up and see if you could get stories of whole groups of people, whole uh, segments of society, whole questions of audience. And so my question was, who was the audience of holiday postcards? And perhaps, uh, although this wasn't central to my my project, the postcard phenomenon of the early 20th century overall. Who were the, these core audiences? Um, and having worked, like I said, about two years with census records, trade publications, government reports, periodicals, newspapers, magazines, um, the answer sort of came out that it, even though this was a national phenomenon, even though you can probably find a postcard from, from just about any state if you dig hard enough, disproportionate representation and really the groups that made it a phenomenon, made it a fad, made it a craze that you know was the, the thing that everyone was talking about and dealing with for about three or four years in the early 20th century, were certain key audiences. And those audiences were disproportionately rural and small town, disproportionately in the northern half of the country, and especially the further you went towards New England, the hotter the craze became. Uh, Maine, Connecticut, Vermont, um, New Hampshire, New England states were using uh, holiday postcards um, at just four or five times what would be proportional um, for the period. They were just avid users, avid collectors, avid um, audiences for holiday postcards. And as you might expect for people that live in that region, they were primarily white, um, drawn from Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, or what, we, what was called native-born, people that had been in the country for two or three generations. Um, and not on here, um, but also re extremely relevant, primarily women and the children that were under their charge. These were c conversations of, by postcards that were occurring primarily among networks of uh, family and kin, uh, by women, for women, um, and their children. 
So having sort of looked at who the audiences were, the next piece of this is, well, what's going on in, at this time? What's going on in these people's lives? Um, and, and there were all sorts of things that were happening to rural and small town Americans, um, a lot of which Donnie actually touched on, great, great setup um, from, from his presentation, about you know, this, this shift from uh, rural America to, um, to a, a predominantly urban population. And in fact, uh, at the time of the postcard, the 1910 census was the one that officially uh, completed that, that shift. 1910 was the shift where more Americans were living in urban um, as defined by the census versus rural, which was communities of 2,500 or less. Um, it was obviously a long process, but this was sort of the capstone of it. Uh, increased immigration. 1907 was the peak of immigration, and of course, immigration coming from countries that were different than the first waves of immigration. These were not uh, Germanic, Teutonic, uh, Western Europeans. These were um, Russians, Slavs, Italians, Greeks, um, different communities of Jewish immigrants. Um, Turks, you know, all these Eastern and Southern European immigrants that were coming in, and all we, although we associate them primarily with cities, many of them were moving into rural communities and rural, uh, rural communities up and down the Eastern seaboard into New England into sort of this bastion of old school, old uh, traditional um, rural America. And then perhaps most important for this time period is that you have an exact overlay with the country life movement. And the country life movement was the progressive movement, of course progressives wanted to fix everybody. You know, if they, if they could figure out a problem, they would figure out solutions for it. But at some point, they set their sights on rural Americans. And in 1907, uh, Teddy Roosevelt called a country life commission together to figure out how to fix rural Americans, how to fix the farmers, because they were obviously broken. Um, they weren't producing enough. They didn't know how to tend their lands. Um, their farms were decrepit. Um, what were some of the other charges? Uh, women, women were overworked. They were little, little better than slaves was a common phrase for the country life movement. Um, and so from the, from the time this commission is started and they do their tour all over the country and they have town meetings and of course every newspaper is reporting on, on this and it gets uh, discussed in, in the rural press and rural periodicals um, all the way until the report came out in 1909 that said, okay, well this is how we fix them. Um, there was this ongoing conversation about what was wrong with rural America. And so, you know, there's a lot of stresses going on for these audiences, these small, rural small town audiences at this time. Um, and so what, what do people do in that situation? And it's exactly what Donnie was talking about in his presentation. We reach into an idealization of ourselves. We reach into our fantasies. We reach into our collective dreams, our collective aspirations. And I think that's what you see in Thanksgiving postcards. If you look over the breadth of Thanksgiving postcards, even before we start to get into the patriotic ones, you have this really forceful visual projection of the rural ideal um, into um, you know, just postcard after postcard of this rural idealization. And especially if you think about Thanksgiving. You know, what, well, what is Thanksgiving? You know, Thanksgiving is the feast where we celebrate produce, we celebrate what the farm has produced, we celebrate what New England has produced, you know, the story of the pilgrims and the Indians. You know, this is a New England rural holiday. And so if you're looking to sort of tap into a network of, of, of idealizations and fantasies and, and things to, to make a claim about yourselves, to make yourselves feel better, to sort of serve as a, as a firewall against all of this junk being handed your way, whether it's the debates of the country life movement or the stress of, of immigration and, and questions about you know, whether your son and your daughters are going to stay on the farm or not, you, know, you reach into this sort of, of imagery to help shore up your identity and to shore up your, your aspirational self. And so if you sort of use that as a baseline of, of, of sort of the beginning of Thanksgiving imagery, um, you know, you can start to see how that can be extrapolated out. And I think I want to pause on this one real quick and just sort of highlight how this, this worked in holiday postcards. You know, this, this is fairly typical. I think you could go, you know, into the fair, into the, the Thanksgiving postcard section and probably find, you know, two or three dozen images just like this in, in one permutation or another. But, you know, 
there's some really interesting keys going on in this. You know right away that you're on a farm. I mean, you can see out into the barn, you know, into the yard. You see the barn. You know that this turkey is being brought in. Um, you know, but look how big everything is. I mean, the turkey is as big as the kid. You know, there's this huge amount of food down here. Um, everybody is dressed well. You know that they're rural Americans, but you can also see that they're middle class Americans. They aren't these sort of uh, decrepit, ailing, um, country life uh, basket cases that need to be fixed. You know, these are middle class, well groomed, well dressed, well established, well funded, well fed um, Americans. And I think especially this is, is really telling that the, the patriarch of, of this ideal farm, this, I, the, uh, this idealized rural family, you know, where is his hand? It's on his produce. It's on the product of, that he has contributed, not just to this family, but to the bounty of the country. You know, this is his contribution, and that's why his hand is on it. I mean, now, if someone brought him this much food for my grandmother to make, <laughs> for a family of you know four, maybe you know, maybe there's a husband somewhere watching football. Um, <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous, but that's the point. It's 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 the emphasis of bounty and whose bounty it is. You know, where did this bounty come from? It came from him, the central, mythological, fanciful, aspirational figure of rural America. <laughs> is that a Father Christmas? Yeah, I mean, it's and, and not not a not a big leap from what we'll see in just a couple more slides of, of Uncle Sam. So I think once you sort of have this as your baseline, once you start thinking of these postcards from, in this context, then it's really easy to understand where these sort of uh, patriotic emblems start to creep in. You know, the, the idealized rural landscape then starts to become a metaphor for national bounty, national importance, national prestige, national significance. Um, so you plop in a red, white, and blue shield. Um, this little couplet at the top, I think, is really uh, interesting. Well, the fruit of honest labor. Whose labor is this? Honest labor, rural labor, you know, farmer labor. You know, not, not anybody that needs to be fixed, not anybody that needs to be solved, but you know, the, the, the true heart of the American um, landscape um, in this, this honest labor, this rural labor. And I think it's important, just you know, a quick digression, and I know I'm, I'm short on time, you know, as Donnie showed, the, the rural landscape, the rural ideal is not new. It's not unique to postcards. It's not unique to 1907 to 1910. It goes, goes way back, you know, um, Courier and Knives, for example. Um, but I think what's important is even though the basic tropes are the same, the basic building blocks are the same, they change context to context. So, a Courier Knives image has a different use for the people in the 1840s and 1850s than the same basic concept might have for people in 1907, 1908, on through 1910. And so again, going back to this idea of fantasies, the, the idea of, of Thanksgiving being a, a national holiday that emphasizes the contributions of bounty, of food, of rural production, you know, all of these things being brought in a pumpkin, uh, pumpkin or gourd uh, chariot, drawn in by, by, again, a gigantic turkey. Again, you know, one of the big lev concerns leveled by the country life movement were farmers were underproducing. They weren't producing enough, they were underproducing, they weren't using good techniques, and so their farms were underproducing. So what do you see in postcards? Everything is gigantic. Everything is, everything is bigger than it, than it could possibly be. Um, so again, sort of drawing from, from the ideas of what's going to make us feel better, what's going to counteract um, what's going on in reality. And once you start seeing this, then the doors are, are, are wide open. Um, the doors are flung wide open. And so you get the juxtaposition. Um, it just gets more and more extreme. You get Uncle Sam brought in, you get bald eagles brought in, you get soldiers, you get sailors. Um, that, you know, this idea of, of the rural contribution um, 
to this national bounty being a patriotic, being a civic, being a national contribution, um, sometimes more explicit than others. Yeah. For good citizenship, eating off a flag-draped table with the turkey in the middle. I mean, it doesn't get much more blatant than this. Um, this is the, the sort of ultimate extrapolation of, of this fantasy. And of course, it's not just in postcards. I think this is one of the things that we have to be mindful of is when we, when we do research like this is, is how this plays out over the course of, of multiple mediums. And so you see this in, this is a uh, cover from Harper's Weekly. Um, you see it in, in women's journals. You see it in men's journals. You see it in agricultural journals. Um, you know, this idea of linking food, bounty, and, and some sort of national message. Um, I put this one in, too, because uh, I want to come back to this figure here. Oops, where did I point it go? Well, Columbia. I'll just point. <laughs> um, so I think you see sort of, you know, how I, how I ended up filling, you know, a book with, with all of this um, is once you start down this road, once you sort of triangulate, okay, who is audience, what was the time period, and what's the context, and then what are the images you see over and over and over again? Again, if you go into the fair and you, you pull out a, a handful of Christmas postcards or Thanksgiving postcards or Easter postcards, what do you see repeated over and over and over again? That's essentially what my project was about, is sort of triangulating those three things. And then what does that tell you? And what, what lenses can you use to start, to start to see why certain messages, why certain images repeat over and over again? And so you can use this for to view any you know, race, nativism, imperialism, gender. And so in the time I have left, I want to just give one more quick example of, of sort of how this worked in my project um, with a question that I, I actually had you know, very early on. And that's the question of women. And, and not just women in particular, but our women in general, but Columbia. I think this doesn't run as fast on this one. There we go. But Columbia especially. Because if you look at all of these Thanksgiving postcards, all of these images, it's a very male world of all these male figures bringing the national bounty, bringing the rural bounty to, um, to America. So you have you know, you know, all these male figures. And yet, we know Columbia existed. Uh, Columbia was a sort of pat figure, um, you know, metaphorical figure uh, that was available. And so, and yet, in all, all my years of looking at these Thanksgiving postcards, this is actually the only one that I found where, where Columbia is the exact equivalent to Uncle Sam. Um, I see tons of Uncle Sam over and over again. This is the only one of Columbia in that sort of exact same role. And the question is, why? And again, it comes back to context. It comes back to placing these images in the time period that they're from. And one of the things I discovered is that the suffragette movement that was occurring about this same time had appropriated Columbia. Uh, and, uh, the nation embodied by a female? Yes, you know, let's use that to talk about giving women the right to vote. Um, and so Columbia appears over and over again in a suffragette context. Well, rural and small town, German, uh, Teutonic, um, New England, these were sometimes fairly conservative audiences. Um, and not all of them were necessarily behind uh, some of the goals of the suffragette movement. And so if you ask why you only see Columbia, in my, in my case, you know, singularly, um, one answer to that might be because it has another context at the same time. Columbia has another role uh, beyond the metaphor that we see with food and bounty. Um, so in conclusion, you know, these... Thanksgiving images in particular, patriotic images in particular, are about a specific group of Americans looking for ways to express and circulate a tailored vision of themselves, the fantasies um, that we were just talking about during a holiday particularly suited to that vision. And that is my flash. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have time for questions? Thank you. 
right hand and raise them. And the person will go, you have to pass the test five, you know, <laughs> Thanks. Well, I, I definitely think you know the idea of the middle class is more than just you know you have disposable income. Um, it is very much a construction of fantasies, ideals, aspirations um, that are never fulfilled. I mean, I think going back to the the conversation we were having before, I don't think you have many reactions to aspirational imagery because we're all convinced that's what we're supposed to aspire to. You know, we don't want to say that's not what I want to be. Um, it's only when you start to see denigrating images and, and when it crosses the line into something that you don't want. Um, women have gotten too sexual. Um, Irish are, are too caricatured. Um, that, you know, and, and, and St. Patrick's Day postcodes. Um, that you start to have that veneer pulled back and start to say, you know, no, I'm not interested in this imagery. I'm not, this is, your your projecting something that I don't want, I don't agree with, I don't believe in. Um, and that's, that's when the sort of the, the illusionary effect starts to be pulled back a little bit. You know, you start to say, you're, you're creating something that I don't agree with. And that's where you start to get discourse about, you know, do I agree with these images? Do I agree with this advertising? Do I agree with what's being presented? And it's really only when it becomes negative, very rarely when it's, when it's aspirational and positive. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's an interesting question. So the, the survey that formed the basis of, of the, the initial looking at audience was actually conducted on eBay. Um, I actually spent a year <laughs> monitoring every, some of which you may have uh, posted. Uh, but any time a seller, um, and I did multiple sellers over the course of the year, gave me the back of a postcard in a scan, I was able to compare that to the census records. And I built a database of about 2,000 census, 2000 census records of postcard recipients. I was able to extrapolate out some of these audiences. Um, I then you know, had to sort of fact check that against everything else I talked about, you know, government reports, periodicals, but was able to see you know, that, that that really was the case. Once I switched, once I had my audience question confirmed and switched gears um, to actual image analysis, um, there were some great resources available. New York Public Library, Smithsonian has too. Because I was doing postcards and they were really cheap, a lot of times I just did an author's collection. I just bought them myself. Um, and actually everything in the book, so I, I wouldn't have to deal with copyright issues, are just author's collection. Um, but, you know, there are great, um, great collections of holiday postcards um, in the D.C. area where I am, as well as here in New York, um, as well as, you know, I know repositories all over the country. Um, the database itself is available, and you know, uh, for people to contact me if they want one. It's you know all saved in, in FileMaker Pro. Um, and this was something I had to deal with uh, as a scholar was the idea of you know these were unique. I talk about ephemeral. You know the eBay auction is gone. You know that screen is gone. Um, you know, it's, it's preserved in my database, but, you know, I talk at length about, you know, the ramifications of that and how we get around it, including, you know, and you can always just ask me for a CD of the database if you want it, so. But real quick, it's one reason why I spend, you know, probably about a dozen pages giving my methodology so that people can actually replicate it as well. Actually, my next project is, um, 1950s popular culture and ephemera, um, and the conservation movement that emerges in the 60s and 70s. So, so yeah, brand new. <laughs> Switch gears. One more.
Oh, good. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> If there is one at all, yeah, right. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 <laughs>